Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Tindall. I am the executive director of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, where our mission is to foster curiosity and a spirit of discovery in visitors of all ages, enhancing public understanding of and an appreciation for the natural world, science, and human cultures. This mission in mind, I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's lecture, How Beer Made Kings in Early Egypt sponsored by the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East. We are delighted to have Dr. Matthew Adams with us tonight, who will discuss the relationship between beer production and the development of kingship in ancient Egypt. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions anytime during the program, and our speaker will address as many as time allows at the end of the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce Peter Dare Manwellian, Barbara Bell Professor of Egyptology at Harvard University and Director of the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. Welcome, everyone. Delighted to have you with us and the many, many hundreds of people out there who are joining us, morning, evening, afternoon, whatever your time zone is. Um, before we start, I'd just like to ask you to pull out your calendars because we have one other lecture scheduled this semester, and that is on Thursday, November 18, 6 o'clock, Thursday, November 18, and we'll be joined by Susanna Gensica from the Getty Conservation Institute, and she'll be talking about the Aoloi, the flutes, ancient flutes found in Meroe in the Sudan by the Harvard University Boston Museum of Fine Arts Expedition how to put them back together, what they sounded like. And if you're lucky, there may even be a sound demo or two. So Thursday, November 18 for that. But tonight we're in for a treat. Matthew Douglas Adams is senior research scholar in Egyptian archeology span and director of Abydos Archeology span at the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. And he holds a dual PhD in anthropology and Egyptology from the University of Pennsylvania. He's led the search for evidence of Egypt's first kings at Abydos for more than 20 years. And his research interests include the emergence of kingship and the state in Egypt, the nature and evolution of sacred landscapes, and the organization and dynamics of society as reflected in Egyptian urban sites and funerary practice. In addition to his extensive excavations, he also directs a pioneering architectural conservation program at the monumental cult enclosure of King Kasekemwi of the Second Dynasty. His most recent publications include articles on the origins of sacredness at Abydos and Abydos in late antiquity for the British Museum series on ancient Egypt and the Sudan published by Peters. His work has been featured in the New York Times, National Geographic Magazine, The New Yorker, and a number of television documentaries. His experience of the Egyptian revolution of 2011 and its aftermath are also featured in The Buried by noted author Peter Hessler, published by Penguin in 2019. And I may be wrong about this, but I believe this may be his first public presentation on the topic tonight. So we are very lucky to welcome him to Harvard for How Beer Made Kings in Early Egypt. Matt, the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh for your very kind introduction, Peter. It's a real pleasure uh, to be with you all this evening. Uh, it is in fact my first uh, public uh, uh, lecture uh, talking about uh, our most recent work involving the uh, beer related uh, discoveries uh, at Abydos. And so uh, uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to uh, have the opportunity to share this the very first share with the Harvard uh, community. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the site of Abydos where we work is uh, around three, just a second here. Here we go. Is around 300 miles or 500 kilometers or so south of modern Cairo on the west bank of the Nile River uh, just at the boundary between the uh, green Nile alluvial plain and the edge of the uh, Western desert that stretches all across North Africa for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Uh, the site uh, is perhaps most well known uh, as the primary cult place of the god Osiris, who was ruler of the land of the dead and who the ancient Egyptians believed 
uh, was a, uh, a, a king of Egypt in the mists of mythic time. Uh, here we see uh, relief of an enthroned Osiris uh, receiving, uh, I believe it's incense being burned for him by King Seti I in his uh, incredibly beautiful temple uh, at Abydos, which is the uh, primary monument that visitors to the site uh, see today. But Abydos is a huge site complex. Uh, the, the Seti temple is only a very small part of that. And uh, we're going to be talking today primarily about the area that you see at the lower right of your screen inside that circle. It's north of the ancient town uh, and right on the edge, right on the boundary uh, between the alluvial plain and the uh, low desert. This is an area where British archeologist, Eric Peet uh, worked on behalf of the Egypt Exploration Society uh, over several seasons in the early 1900s, just before the First World War. Here he is in his sartorial field splendor. Um, and this is his excavation in this area. Uh, the, the archeologists working uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century at the site were primarily focused on the vast cemetery fields which stretched across the desert uh, west of the ancient town site. And Pete was no exception. Uh, this excavation in particular was at the northernmost edge of the cemetery fields, an area that he called Cemetery D. Here he found a, 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 a dense cluster of modest mud brick mastaba tombs belonging to the early Old Kingdom. So dynasties three and four uh, from around 2700 to 2500 or so, probably toward the earlier uh, end of that range. Uh, but strangely, under these tombs and around them, Pete found another kind of archeological remain entirely, a completely different phenomenon, had nothing to do with tombs and not even from the same period he found concentrations of large pottery vats, such as you see here, which were supported on the outside by fired mud legs or props. He really did not understand what this was. There was a lot of evidence of burning in and around these features. Uh, he suggested that uh, it may have been used for a heat drying grain uh, to make it more stable for preservation. Uh, but this was just a suggestion. Uh, the largest and best preserved example uh, had 32 of these vats in place and he very uh, usefully uh, published a plan of just that one uh, and or the portion that he saw, as well as a cross section, which shows the arrangement of the interior. Uh, you see the V-shaped pottery vat, it actually is conical, uh, and then it's supported on the outside by these fired mud uh, legs, fire dogs is one term for them. Uh, these were set into a kind of semi-subterranean long narrow structure the side walls of which were defined by bricks that actually were pieces of these fire legs reused. Uh, and then the, uh, the, uh, there were traces of uh, roofing made from the same materials. The only site plan that he published uh, related to the early Old Kingdom tombs, and you see them here, but he, although he described the these pyrotechnic features, uh, he did not show them in relationship to the Old Kingdom tombs. He just said they were in the same general area 
and some of them were under these tombs. Well, having long been involved in investigating uh, the nature of early royal activity uh, at Abydos, this is uh, from Dynasties 1 and 2, I uh, had had in the back of my mind for many years that I should have a look at what was happening uh, in this area. And in 2018, partnering with my colleague, Deborah Vishak of Princeton, uh, we jointly opened new excavation in this area. She was interested in uh, uh, looking again at the organization of the early Old Kingdom tombs. And of course, I was interested in these earlier uh, pyrotechnic features, which seem to date to around 3000 BC, somewhere in the Magadha III uh, general time frame, uh, which would equate to just about the time that political unification came to Egypt, uh, that the state emerged, uh, and that the king at the pinnacle of social organization uh, was established, uh, creating the pharaonic uh, image of ancient Egypt that we're all familiar with today. Uh, this is uh, an overview of our 2018 season excavations. There are Pete's Old Kingdom uh, brick tombs, uh, but we very quickly uh, recognized around them, under them, several of his pyrotechnic features. They're marked here by these uh, arrows. Uh, you might be able to see them a bit better here, they're uh, fairly regularly arranged, uh, oriented uh, east-west locally, uh, and then running from north toward uh, the south. We saw five in uh, 2018. Uh, each one, uh, this is a general view of part of one of these structures, uh, they were defined by these side walls uh, of fire legs reused as bricks. And then here are the vat emplacements uh, inside the structure. The structures were not very uh, deep, only about half a meter, uh, but they clearly had been abandoned and had sanded up and eroded uh, at the time that these Old Kingdom tombs were uh, built. So the, the Old Kingdom tombs were built on the ground surface that existed in around 2700. Uh, and these features were already uh, buried and denuded uh, at that time. In 2020, uh, our most recent season uh, at the site, uh, we uh, expanded on the 2018 area moving to the south and we saw much more of feature five and uh, a large area of, of feature six that you see here. Uh, number five in particular uh, is very informative because it gives a sense of the uh, length of these things uh, as much as 20 meters or more than 20 meters and probably originally containing 40 or more of these vat uh, emplacements. They have been cut into, partly uh, destroyed by uh, later intrusive features, Middle Kingdom tombs, New Kingdom tombs, uh, but enough uh, survives to, uh, for us to gain a, a very solid picture of what was going on. Each one of the vat emplacements uh, contained a conical pottery vessel, it was probably originally 75 centimeters high or so uh, with a rim diameter of about the same, um, <clears throat> supported on the outside by these vertically placed fire legs, which were uh, stuck into the ground, the floor of the uh, structure around each vessel. Inside each one uh, in the base was a second smaller uh, bowl I'll get to the reason for that uh, in just a moment. This is what we think uh, a full uh, structure may have looked like. Uh, we do have 
uh, the end, one end of uh, structure number five. Uh, and so we're assuming that on average they had uh, 40 or perhaps slightly more than 40 uh, vats. Each vat originally higher reached the roof of the structure, but leaving the, the opening to the vessel uh, unblocked. So the interior of each vessel was accessible uh, uh, through which it could be filled and then emptied again. The, uh, the interior of the structure around the space around all of these vats was actually a firebox. Uh, this was a firing chamber um, and there was extra mud insulation applied to the outside of the vat uh, to help with temperature control for the cooking of whatever was originally put inside during this firing process. The, uh, the fuel and air for the fire uh, were introduced through a whole series of stoke holes that were uh, arranged equidistantly along both the long sides of the structure. And we actually found uh, quite a few of these preserved uh, in all of the uh, back or all of the structures that we've excavated uh, so far. Uh, under each of these uh, stoke holes, uh, we found uh, frequent evidence of wood fuel from the last firing episode. Here you see some of the charcoal uh, that uh, survives. Uh, and to the right, those uh, look like finger marks in mud. Uh, the, that's actually the surface of the stoke hole uh, through which the uh, wood fuel was introduced. We have not yet, uh, but will hopefully very soon be doing C14 on charcoal samples from uh, these structures uh, to help pin down the date, which is still uh, a little bit up in the air. Many of the vats contained organic residues. Uh, Pete uh, observed this as well. Uh, it frequently was uh, burned black. Uh, it's shiny. Uh, it gives the impression, and quite hard, it gives the impression of uh, something being almost resinous. Uh, uh, it, it clearly contains a charred grain of some kind. Pete identified it as wheat, uh, but the, the species of wheat uh, uh, we don't yet know. It's very likely to have been emmer, um, uh, which was which is uh, widely attested in early Egyptian beer brewing uh, at other sites, which I'll come to in a moment. So uh, scholars in the last 20 years or so have uh, made very significant gains in understanding the nature of ancient Egyptian beer production, the various steps that were involved um, and uh, what we likely have, I won't go through all of this step by step, uh, but what we likely have in our facility uh, is shown by this red oval. Uh, grain was mixed with water. Uh, ground grain was mixed with water. Uh, sprouted grain or malt may have also been ground uh, and mixed with this uh, 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 mixture to be cooked. Uh, the firing uh, uh, released the starches from the uh, grain and the enzymes from the malt. And these two things together, the enzymes processed the starches, which created sugars. And then yeast would ferment those sugars, creating beer. Uh, we don't know where the fermentation took place, if it took place in the vats or in uh, other vessels 
after the bats had been emptied. And we hope to uh, work this out in upcoming studies. Now, beer production in early Egypt is known from uh, several sites. Two in particular are extremely important in understanding the emergence of uh, beer production on a scale above the household uh, level. One is the site of Hierakompolis, uh, uh, south of modern Luxor, uh, near Edfu. Uh, here, uh, Renee Friedman and her colleagues have uh, discovered a number of breweries that date to uh, the fourth millennium BC. The largest one is at a site called HK24B, dating to the middle of the fourth millennium BC. The basic technology is the same, vat emplacements, lots of ash. Uh, the whole thing was a firing chamber to cook whatever was inside the vats. The vats were supported on the outside uh, because filled with liquid, the pottery vessels wouldn't, uh, they weren't strong enough to hold all that weight. Um, and uh, through uh, botanical studies, uh, it's now uh, determined with certainty that beer, a fermented grain material was being produced uh, in this and other brewing facilities. Uh, one notable aspect uh, that I would ask you to keep in mind, there were 16 bats in this particular uh, brewery. Uh, uh, Friedman estimates that uh, this would result in production of around a bit more than 1,000 liters per batch. This is a lot of beer uh, in absolute terms, and it's certainly much greater than what would be needed at household level. Uh, and it's a useful point of reference uh, for thinking about this in comparison to the Abydos Brewery. Uh, another important site is in the, at the opposite end of ancient Egypt in the Eastern Nile Delta, Tel El Farha, uh, being investigated for some years now by a Polish mission. They also have uh, beer brewing facilities, uh, um, uh, somewhat modest in character, similar to those at Hierakompolis. Same basic technology. Uh, here's one of the larger ones with 11 vat emplacements and an estimated production capacity of around 625 liters. Uh, this also dates to just after the middle of the uh, fourth millennium BC. So both of them, some centuries before uh, the, uh, the facilities at Abydos. So turning again to our facility, let's look at what they were making and how much of it they could have made. Uh, considering one vat, the estimated volume of one of these vessels around 70 liters, uh, multiply that by the number of vat emplacements in each structure, around 40 on average, that means that the production capacity of one of these brewery structures is around 2,800 liters per batch. So this is already a substantial increase over what we see at either uh, Farha or Hierakonpolis. Then consider uh, that number times eight at least eight. Pete mentions having observed eight of these structures. We've seen six uh, so far. He may have seen all that there are, but there may have been more. We hope to find out in a coming field season. And in the lower right, you see uh, examples from Farha and uh, Hierakompolis at approximately the same scale. So you can see already that uh, the facility at Abydos is much, much larger than those at either one of the other early uh, sites. And just to give you a sense of the scale, the overall area covered by the Abydos Brewery is around 85 meters uh, north to south and around 20 meters uh, east to 
West. The total production capacity for the facility as a whole, 2,800 liters times eight, 22,400 liters total production per batch. Uh, this is certainly industrial scale production uh, by any scale, uh, by any point of uh, uh, reference. Um, 22,400 liters per batch is substantial production even today uh, for a microbrewery, for example. Uh, I mean, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't approach uh, anything like the production capacity of Budweiser or something like that, but um, uh, uh, still, it's a very substantial amount of beer. Now, to give you uh, a, a point of reference to think about what 22,000 liters of beer means in human terms, the seating capacity of Fenway Park is 37,700. And if we have 22,400 liters, if you give each person a pint or so, that is about half a liter, that's 44,800 servings of beer, which is substantially more than would be needed to give a pint to every person in a completely full Fenway Park. Uh, it, it's an incredible uh, volume of beer, uh, particularly given the early time frame, 3000 BC or so, uh, and the, uh, uh, the level of political and economic uh, development that was exhibited by Egypt at this time. Why? would early kings or anyone at this early time, around 3000 BC, why would anyone need this amount of beer? What possibly, what would they possibly been using it for? Well, I, the answer to this, uh, in my view, uh, uh, is in considering the broader context in which the brewery occurs. I mentioned that Abydos is a very substantial uh, site complex stretching across the desert, uh, roughly contemporary with the brewery uh, in this area. Uh, there is a collection of early royal tombs uh, arranged just in front of this large desert canyon all the kings of Egypt's first dynasty and two kings of Egypt's second dynasty, spanning the period around 3000 or 3100 down to around 2700, uh, built their tombs at the site. And these were the locations of the actual burials. In some of the older literature, uh, there's discussion about, well, perhaps these were cenotaphs or false tombs, but uh, there's no question at this point that these were the royal tombs. And this was Egypt's first great royal necropolis, akin to the, uh, the, the, the pyramid fields uh, around ancient Memphis uh, at a site like Giza, another at Saqqara and so on, uh, or the Valley of the Kings some centuries later. Here's just an example of one of these tombs, uh, that of King Den, middle of the first dynasty. Uh, the burial chambers were uh, subterranean features um, that were originally roofed. Uh, they probably had some kind of superstructure, but uh, the surviving traces suggest that it was very modest in character, a sort of tumulus of, of, of some kind or other. Uh, and the surface features were also uh, marked by the presence of pairs of royal stele, uh, giving the name of the occupant of each uh, tomb. And here are some surviving examples of those stele. Uh, 
Well, as I mentioned, the superstructures uh, were quite modest uh, at the royal tombs, and the tombs themselves are in quite a remote location uh, 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 in Abydos, quite far from the ancient town, and wouldn't really have been visible from there. Uh, however, another area uh, which we've been excavating for many years now uh, also has royal monuments from exactly the same time. And this is the area highlighted uh, in black. One of these survives today. Uh, it's colloquially known locally as the Shunit de Zabib, uh, but it was built by King Khasak Emwi, uh, the last of the early kings to build his tomb at, uh, at Abydos. Uh, the walls are still extremely impressive, uh, standing 35 feet high or so, uh, 15 feet thick, uh, and still around their bases preserve quite a lot of the original uh, finish of white plaster. Originally, it would have been uh, this gleaming white monumental edifice uh, in the desert landscape. Uh, it had a monumental uh, gateway at the north corner, and uh, the interior space uh, is nearly 10,000 square meters, so it's quite large. Uh, in area. This is what it looks like in plan. Uh, it was never roofed, open to the sky, uh, with one small uh, chapel uh, in the southern portion of the interior. Uh, we've been working for 20 years now uh, investigating this monument, as well as a number of others that I'll come to. Um, and uh, 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 both the interior and the exterior. Uh, our excavations in 2012, you see here uh, on the southern exterior side, uh, we discovered uh, to our great surprise that the entire area that you see exposed in this photograph was completely covered by a vast deposit of pottery vessels of a particular kind tens of thousands of them. These are all beer jars. These are vessels that are very specific. Uh, 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 they're used for, uh, uh, for beer. They were stoppered with mud uh, on the top. And these were the ancient Egyptian equivalent of our modern beer bottles. And this is the, uh, the beer of Egypt today, uh, Stella. All Egyptologists uh, are extremely familiar with, uh, with this beer. There are ancient representations of very similar kinds of vessels uh, being filled with beer. Uh, the person on the left is straining uh, the, uh, the chunks and bits uh, out of the beer, uh, which is then put in these uh, jars and stoppered by the fellow on the right. Uh, with conical shaped mud stoppers. This deposit at the Khasakemwi monument uh, also contained a large number of seal impressions like the one that you see here. Uh, uh, these were used to give an official stamp on documents, on containers of various kinds, boxes, bags, uh, uh, and pottery vessels, including beer jars. Uh, this one has the name of the king, Kha um, We also found large deposits of bovine crania uh, and uh, bovine heads were uh, frequently depicted in scenes of ritual offerings in ancient Egypt. Uh, and beer was also uh, frequently referenced in uh, ancient Egyptian ritual texts talking about the presentation of beer as offerings, uh, particularly in funerary contexts. Uh, so I would suggest that what we have here with the Bucrania, the seal impression from opening containers of various kinds and the thousands upon thousands of beer jars, we have the material remains from the offering ritual that was conducted inside this monument. Uh, after the, the uh, material had been presented probably to the king in his uh, uh, 
the divine aspect of his uh, kingship. Uh, it was carried out the southern gateway and dumped over this entire area. Uh, this deposit in places is more than a meter deep and covers hundreds of square meters. Uh, the monument of Chasakemwi is not the only one of these early royal monuments that's known. Uh, at the lower right uh, in this photograph, uh, you see just a bit of wall uh, emerging from the sand there. Uh, and this is uh, the uh, cultic enclosure of his predecessor, King Parabsen uh, of the late second dynasty. In front of Parabsen's monument, another big deposit of beer jars. These belong to Parabsen, not to uh, Chasakemwi. Uh, in fact, Chasakemwi's, the floor of his monument extends over uh, this deposit, which was full of seal impressions uh, bearing Parabsen's name. So the same pattern of activity uh, is uh, observed here. Uh, in case you don't believe me that this was a huge royal uh, cultic enclosure now buried, uh, here's the monumental north gateway of Parabsen's monument uh, with the footprint indicated by the uh, dashed line uh, for the whole monument. Uh, our work uh, over the years has revealed uh, several previously unknown uh, early, or early monuments uh, from Dynasty One, in particular. Uh, here we have the denuded wall stubs uh, from one such. Uh, it's smaller than the Dynasty Two enclosures, but still quite substantial. Here's what it uh, uh, originally looked like: the standing walls, the small interior chapel in the southern part. Uh, just the same as we saw with uh, Hasegemwi and as we know from Parabsen. Uh, inside in the chapel, uh, in this area in particular, uh, this seems to have been the focus of the performance of offering ritual, uh, this bench built against the wall. It's covered in organic stains uh, that seem to be the result of pouring out liquid uh, offerings uh, in this small room. So again, evidence for the offering of liquids, the pouring out in a ritual context on behalf of the king of liquid offerings. Uh, this monument uh, was associated with, uh, or had several subsidiary features around it, indicated by these arrows. And these are tombs. Uh, the, the enclosure itself was a kind of temple uh, uh, but uh, it was surrounded by uh, a number of uh, smaller tombs. They're still quite substantial. Their walls are more than a meter thick, uh, but they were subterranean uh, features, roofed and uh, 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 below the ancient ground level. Uh, it was the uh, remains of the grave goods from these uh, tombs that uh, showed us who was the owner of this uh, cultic enclosure. Uh, the uh, fragment of one of the wine jar stoppers and the seal impression used on it gave the name of the Horus Aha uh, from the beginning of the first dynasty. Uh, the occupants of the tombs themselves uh, were jumbled by ancient robbers, but uh, still present. Uh, you can see a bit of the wooden uh, floorboards of the coffin and the cranium of the tomb occupant uh, there. These graves were provided with quite expensive grave goods, uh, Egyptian alabaster or calcite uh, vessels, ivory arrow points, uh, jewelry of various kinds. Uh, one of the graves was uh, used for the burial of a three or four year old child who had ivory uh, bangle bracelets around a set of around 20 uh, there in front of his or her legs. Uh, as well as uh, amulets of lapis lazuli that you can see here, uh, extremely precious material in ancient Egyptian times coming from 
uh, Afghanistan, modern Afghanistan. This is what the monument looked like uh, originally uh, uh, with the uh, subsidiary tombs arranged around it. It did not, uh, however, uh, stand alone. Nearby, just to the north, uh, two additional smaller enclosures have been found, also accompanied by subsidiary graves, not as large, not as well provisioned, uh, but still with the occupants and very surprisingly giving the name again of King Aha. So that accounts for three enclosures for King Aha. We also excavated uh, yet another much larger enclosure to the west of the first one of, of Aha, uh, mostly obscured by a modern cemetery, but same basic design, uh, mon thick uh, enclosure wall gateway at the east corner, uh, accompanied by subsidiary graves. Uh, the doorway was filled with uh, seal impressions, um, more than 200, not one of which gave the name of the owner. Uh, the subsidiary graves, uh, instead of containing human burials, had the burials of 10 very well cared for donkeys. Uh, this is at a time when uh, donkeys were not yet fully domesticated. This is, these examples were halfway between the African wild ass and the, the uh, domesticated donkey. Uh, they were still quite fierce uh, and very strong uh, beasts. And uh, they, the reason why they're buried here uh, is a matter of some uh, discussion and debate, uh, but we can just say that they were of great value uh, to the king who built this enclosure and like the humans were buried to uh, uh, be available to the king in the next world. So right here, we have now the four enclosures that I have just discussed, all of which I think belong to King Aha the large one with the donkeys, they all hang together as a set uh, on the ground uh, at some distance from any other uh, of the known royal monuments. Uh, and so I think it's quite likely that they all belong to him. His tomb is anomalous also having multiple uh, burial chambers. Uh, not long ago, uh, one of our former students from the IFA, Laurel Bestock, uh, was excavating just north of the AHA area. And there she found the remains of yet another early royal enclosure. No name associated with it so far, but pottery and seal impressions that say it has to belong to the very beginning of Dynasty One. So probably pre-Aha, well, the, uh, the king pre-Aha that is uh, best known is King Narmer uh, of the famous Narmer palette, uh, the king who perhaps brought political unity uh, uh, and the unitary state uh, to ancient Egypt. Uh, in the early 1920s, Flinders Petrie excavated just south of the Aha monument area, and he found a rectangle of small graves, uh, all dating to the reign of King Jur, who was Aha's successor. There were 269 uh, of these graves. He, having dug the royal tombs, Petrie thought, oh, there must be a big tomb in the middle of this because the royal tombs were uh, surrounded by arrangements of graves that were similar to this. And this plan shows his various excavation areas looking for the tomb uh, of which there was no trace. Well, what Petrie didn't realize was that his excavation in that large square there came within 20 centimeters of the massive wall of King Jur's 
cultic enclosure, which we have uh, excavated and documented. There you see it in the photograph. And we can now say that uh, King Jur, like Aha, like uh, perhaps Narmer, like Parabsen and Chasak Emwi, had a monumental mud brick cultic enclosure, chapel on the interior, monumental gateways, surrounded by subsidiary graves, but on a much larger scale than his predecessors. So Jur is taking this idea of royal performance, monumental building, human sacrifice to take people with you into the next world, and expressing this on a much larger scale than Aha had done. His tomb is also uh, much, much larger uh, than the tombs of either Aha or Narmer at Umel Gab. Uh, here's our re-excavation of just one a small area of the Jur grave rectangle. Uh, Petrie's photographs of a couple of burials and uh, one of the em now empty uh, grave chambers uh, below. We know that all 269 of these burials were made at exactly the same time, which strongly supports the idea that the people were uh, dispatched to be buried and accompany the king. Now, the 269 burials accompanying Jur's cultic enclosure uh, have to be considered in tandem with those around his tomb. Here's a picture of recent re-excavation of Jur's tomb by the German Institute, by my late uh, colleague, Gunter Dreyer. Uh, Jur's tomb was accompanied by 330 subsidiary graves. It means that between the tomb and the enclosure, King Jur sacrificed and took with him into the next world uh, nearly 600 individuals. Uh, this is, I, I cannot imagine a stronger statement of the nature of royal power uh, being made manifest, um, being materialized uh, and embedded in this landscape at uh, Abydos. Uh, I'll just mention one other of the early royal enclosures. Petrie found one, he didn't realize what it was. He thought it was a Mastaba tomb. Uh, he called it the Western Mastaba. Here's a part of the preserved Western wall of this structure. Uh, but it's another one of these early royal enclosures somewhere in uh, the middle of Dynasty I, uh, perhaps King Den. Uh, but this monument is accompanied by a completely different kind of subsidiary grave. Uh, you might notice those long, narrow structures in the distance uh, next to the wall, these, here's a closer view. These are mud brick structures in the shape of boats that actually contained buried wooden, wooden boat holes. Real wooden boats were entombed inside these boat shaped brick structures. There are 14 of them uh, <clears throat> and We've excavated uh, the interior of one, uh, badly damaged by later pitting, but bits and pieces of the original planks from the wooden hall still survive. Here are the 14 boat graves arranged along the west side of Petrie's Western Mastaba, another early royal uh, funerary cult enclosure. So, from the work of recent years, uh, both from the German uh, mission and also from our work in North Abydos, uh, we have a much clearer uh, idea of the nature of early royal activity at Abydos. It was Egypt's first great royal necropolis seen in the tombs first excavated by Melino and Petrie in the late 19th century, more recently by the German mission. And each tomb appears to have been accompanied by a monumental cult place, the 
cultic enclosure, which you see on the lower right, uh, which were arranged on a desert terrace overlooking the ancient town. If you consider these in the topography of the site, the royal tombs are at quite a remove uh, in the desert uh, from the ancient town, but the royal enclosures are on this elevated desert terrace immediately overlooking uh, the ancient town site. Uh, they would have been uh, highly visible, uh, painted white uh, in the desert uh, landscape, and each one would have represented a statement of monumentality for each king, uh, uh, royal presence, royal power being uh, materialized uh, in this landscape. All of this early royal activity, the emergence of a monumental royal tomb, of the royal necropolis as a thing, as a place, uh, <clears throat> the emergence of monumental construction for ritual purposes, for ritual performance, um, all of this uh, and, and all the activity that goes along with that, the subsidiary graves, the uh, sacrificial burials, the, uh, the uh, entombment of a whole fleet of gigantic wooden boats uh, uh, to accompany the king. All of these things represent various dimensions, various aspects of royal performance through which the nature of kingship is being expressed. They are in the midst of defining what early Egyptian kingship is. By, by what they're doing here, they're saying, this is who we are. Each king is saying, this is me as king, writ large in this sacred place. And this is right at the time when political unification occurs, when the king appears at the apex of uh, the unitary nation state uh, of Egypt, we think of King Narmer represented here uh, on an object from Hierakonpolis uh, as the king who was responsible for that. Uh, he may very well have been, uh, but this, uh, this object uh, we can take as uh, symbolizing or uh, embodying various processes uh, that were going on at this, in this general time and all of this early royal activity at Abydos was part of defining the nature of kingship in this broader context. And this is the context for our brewery. 22,000 liters of beer per batch. And if one batch was made each week, multiply that times 50, two weeks a year, we're well over a million liters of beer annual production, uh, which is uh, almost mind boggling uh, in, in ancient terms, especially in this very early uh, uh, period. But in the context of all of this monumental and ritual performance, uh, royal activity on a vast scale, beer production on a similar sort of scale probably was uh, conducted to feed royal ritual, to provision royal ritual uh, at the site. We have direct evidence for the use of beer in the offering ritual on an enormous scale uh, in several of our early royal cultic enclosures, uh, such as that of uh, Parabsen uh, that you see here. And it's not just the production that was uh, on a large scale. You think about the logistical side of beer making uh, at that level, hundreds of people had to have been involved not only in the actual brewing of the beer, uh, but harvesting and bringing the grain, transporting it from wherever it was grown, uh, transporting the water that was needed, uh, acquiring and transporting the wood fuel 
uh, that was needed, uh, making and transporting all of the ceramic vessels that were used to bottle the beer, the tens of thousands of bottles that would have been uh, involved. It's a vast operation. And this logistical capability is already very clearly and very well established right at the beginning of uh, political unity and the state uh, in early Egypt, right around 3000 BC. It's demonstrated clearly for the first time here at, at Abydos. And it's, it's this capacity, the, the, the capacity to manage logistics on a gigantic scale that went on to characterize uh, the Egyptian state and Egyptian kingship for the remainder of Egyptian history. And this is perhaps most clearly demonstrated by uh, the construction of the pyramids. Mark Lehner and his team have excavated a huge uh, settlement site uh, built to house the officials and workforce involved in the construction of the pyramids at Giza. And as part of this, there were huge bakeries, uh, various uh, food storage facilities and so on. And all of this represents uh, the, the management of logistics uh, on a huge state project. Uh, and, and that ability uh, continued for the, re the remainder of uh, Pharaonic Egyptian history. And that was what empowered ancient Egyptian kings to build at the scale that they did, the pyramids or the uh, gigantic temples that we're familiar with uh, from places like Karnak. So already this important aspect of kingship, the nature of royal power and what royal power could do is very well established at Abydos at the very beginning of Egyptian history and demonstrated by our brewery. Thank you very much indeed.